Today's speech is about electricity. Our ability to harness and distribute electricity is arguably one of the greatest human discoveries of modern time. As the old saying goes, necessity is the mother of invention. Our modern and electrified world has evolved from actual and metaphorical darkness only a few generations ago. Now, electricity is the mother of invention. Electricity illuminates light bulbs, but it also is the source of, di of diplomacy, infrastructure, communication, and agriculture. Quite simply put, electricity is now intertwined with the basic necessities of life. It was at this very podium at the Empire Club in 1907 that Sir Sanford Fleming described electricity as the magical discovery that has forever, that has forever changed humanity. Mankind looked to the skies and harnessed the awesome power that defines modernity. The Empire Club is indeed honored to host this luncheon with the Ontario Energy Association, who represents the entire energy sector in our province. Thanks in part to governments and to the membership of the OEA, Ontario has emerged as one of the most energy efficient economies in the world. To introduce our guest speaker today, please welcome Mr. Mel Idreos, Acting President of the OEA, to introduce our guest. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a real delight to, uh, to be here uh, in partnership with the Empire Club on what is sure to be a most interesting discussion with Minister Chiarelli, led by David McFadden. In a room full of energy experts, I don't need to tell you why we're here. Um, this is very timely. Um, but, but before we get into the discussion about LTEP, it's video time again. As many of you know, last week, Minister Shirelli launched Empower Me, a website designed to help consumers better understand how Ontario's electricity system works. For those of you who may have not checked it out, mark this down, ontario.ca backslash empower me. Here's a quick video on how electricity is made. Can play the video, please? Electricity powers our homes, our businesses, and our communities. We can't see it, but we know it's there. To understand electricity, let's take a closer look at how it's made. About 200 years ago, a man named Michael Faraday discovered how to make an electric current using a metal coil and a magnet. Most of today's electricity is still made exactly this way. But to generate enough electricity for a province the size of Ontario, we need to move big magnets around a wire. This is done with a turbine. The force to turn this turbine could come from wind, water, hot gases, or steam. You can spin a turbine with a natural force, like hydro, that's water, or wind. You can burn natural gas directly in a combustion turbine. The hot expanding gases are used to make it turn. This is essentially the same way jet aircraft are powered. You can also burn natural gas, or oil, to boil water and use the resulting steam to make it turn. Or you can boil water using heat from a nuclear reaction, which also produces steam to turn the turbine. Different energy sources, but all essentially the same result. Solar power is the only one that's different. Instead, it converts sunlight into electricity using solar panels. The photons in a ray of sunlight hit the panel and get converted into an electric current. Hydro, wind, natural gas, nuclear, and solar. Here in Ontario, we use all of these forms of electricity to power our province. And that's what we call generation. To learn more about how you can save energy, save money, and how Ontario is building clean energy, visit ontario.ca slash empowerme. Tell us what you think. Follow us on Twitter. Uh, Minister, congratulations to you and your staff for launching a very informative and timely website. And I encourage all of you to spread the word because it, uh, if you go on site, uh, it's got a lot of really really simple but very, very valuable information uh, to help customers better understand our very complex energy system. So it's been less than 24 hours since the release of the long-term energy plan, and like many of you, I have spent a fair bit of time pouring through the document. 
I know many of us have questions for the minister who has graciously put himself before us today to face the Inquisition. I will say that the OEA is very pleased with what we saw in the long-term energy plan. We feel it strikes a balance between ensuring Ontario's electricity system delivers reliability through flexibility while also tackling affordability of electricity rates to consumers. This move was one of the key recommendations in the OEA's LTIP submission to the government. We look forward, Minister, to working with you and your ministry as we implement the long-term energy plan. It's now my distinct pleasure to introduce our feature guest. Slightly less than a year ago, our next speaker became the subject of intense scrutiny, interest, and anticipation. As Ontario's Minister of Energy, Bob Chiarelli has quite literally jumped from the frying pan into the fire. I think we can admit, as a sector, we're not the easiest stakeholders to deal with. Sometimes dealing with my colleagues in the sector reminds me of a Mark Twain quote, in all matters of opinion, our adversaries are insane. But despite that challenging nature of our industry, the minister has made a valiant effort to reach out. We in the sector believe strongly that successful energy policy is created in partnership with industry. I can think of no better example of this than the LTIP document. While the rubber will only hit the road with implementation, I know from speaking from our members that we're all pleased to see the government is moving in the right direction. But Minister hasn't been limiting, limiting his outreach to the energy sector. No, indeed. The last few weeks he has been busy soliciting pictures of Ontarians Mo's or mustaches via Twitter so he could pick the best to make a donation in honor of Movember. While he wasn't clear on his selection criteria, the minister did make a donation to a gentleman who had a mustache that actually looked suspiciously like the one I used to sport. He described it as bigger, bolder, and bushier than ever. Unfortunately, I did not get to participate in November this year, but Minister, if you're planning to donate again next year, I have two words for you, challenge accepted. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our featured guest, the Honorable Bob Shirelli. <laughs> and now our interviewer as we walk into the podium, for today's speaker series, our very own 2013 OEA Leader of the Year, David McFadden. <laughs> David is a partner and chair of the international group at Gowlings. His leadership in the energy industry has been exceptional. He is a friend and mentor to many of us and has been a strong proponent of the energy sector for the last 30 years. David is also no stranger to Ontario politics. In the mid-80s, he was elected as the MPP for the riding of Eglinton, which also happened to be a minority government. This history gives him a unique understanding of the political climate we're facing in Ontario today. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a round of applause welcoming the minister and David to the stage. Thank you very much, Mel, um, and Minister, welcome. Um, I noticed the title of the event today is the Long-Term Energy Plan Unplugged. But what I'm hoping is by the end of the comments by the Minister today, we'll all be plugged in on exactly what's expect being expected on the energy plan. Um, as Mel said, the plan only came out yesterday, almost exactly 24 hours ago. And I'll tell you, it says something for the Minister that he's here within a day so soon to share his thoughts in terms of what, went, what was on the government's mind in developing the plan and what's really in the plan. Could we start off with a question? Um, you did a lot of consulting before this plan was prepared across the province. You went out, ministry staff went out. 
What was it that you heard from the general public, from the energy industry and other industry about what should be in the plan? Well, there were some common threads. Uh, first of all, one issue that came up regularly was affordability, uh, both in the industrial sector and with, uh, with rate payers. Uh, another question that came up, um, very, very important issue for the industry, was that they wanted an energy sector, energy policy, that was predictable and sustainable. It's very difficult, for example, for people in the renewable industry, solar, for example, to not know when the next procurement is going to take place, whether it's going to take place in four months, six months, or maybe we're going to have a moratorium on it. So uh, we were very, very determined to create policies which were sustainable and predictable. The other thing that we heard on a regular basis was flexibility. The sector is so dynamic now. Uh, there's so many exciting things happening in storage, in conservation, in demand response, uh, that uh, we, we wanted to move forward with the plan, but we had to be able to uh, adjust as we go. So uh, in order to so solve that problem, we uh, came up with the, the concept, and now it's part of the plan, of having an annual energy report that would be produced by the IESO and uh, the Ontario Power Authority, defining where we are with supply and demand and what we'd have to do collectively, all of our government agencies, the ministry, and the sector, to keep ourselves whole and to respond to the dynamics that are happening. Uh, I'm very excited about the energy sector, and uh, I, I got more excited as I got into it, uh, particularly uh, what we're seeing now is a tremendous interface between information technology and the energy sector. We're seeing demand response programs that require sophisticated software. We're seeing a company in Ottawa, Cilantro, that has using software, creating a much more efficient inverter for solar. Uh, you can go on and on and on uh, with storage and uh, smart grid uh, and how to manage the system. Uh, and so uh, we're, we're going to be I think changing uh, for the positive very, very quickly, similar to what we've seen uh, in the communications business with cell phones and, uh, uh, and other technology sectors. So um, we, we wanted to be flexible, and that was one of the things that we heard. Uh, another thing that we heard was a tremendous respect for, for Aboriginal communities, First Nation and Métis communities. There's a real willingness on the part of the sector to partner economic development. They realize that uh, that's the way to go. It's a respectful thing to do. Uh, it makes good business sense. And so we have seen now in the last three or four years an unbelievable uh, acceleration of uh, First Nation and Métis communities uh, partnering and investing uh, and participating in the energy sector. And uh, we're very, uh, very pleased to see it, uh, and we will continue to encourage it. You actually answered about half my questions yeah. already, so <laughs> <laughs> the minister's a very in, easy guy to interview, I should tell you. <laughs> um, why don't, could I ask you a question about the, um, I suppose one of the big elephants in the room is energy pricing. Yes. Um, you mentioned that consumers probably yeah. raised yes. that with you. Needless to say, that's all the media, if you read the media the last 24 hours, you think all the plan almost had in it was price yes. signals. Yes. Yes. I wonder if you can address the issue of, of energy pricing, electricity pricing in Ontario, and, and how you see the plan dealing with that issue. Unfortunately for, for many residents, we saw that uh, we're, we're going to start uh, uh, communicating better with the public. Uh, their understanding of the electricity system is when they get their bill and if their lights go out. And everything else in between, uh, they don't know a lot about it. They're starting to become uh, conversant in, in conservation uh, in, in a fairly significant way. Uh, but uh, we, we need to communicate to the public how complex the sector is, and we've got to try to simplify it uh, for them so that they will understand pricing. But, uh, you know, I was on CBC Radio this morning, uh, and of course it was all pricing. And all my media in the last 24 hours they're the only issues that have come up, and not, not even industrial commercial pricing. It was pricing for, for residential people um, and the uh, on-bill uh, uh, on energy uh, products that we, can, we could generate. So those were the only two areas that came up really from the media. 
so we have a lot of work to do. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the things I'm going to suggest, uh, I think tonight I'm meeting with, with the CEOs uh, and the board chairs of our agencies, OPG, ISO, et cetera, and I have spoken privately with some people in the industry, uh, to come up with the idea of uh, an energy education trust uh, where we can collectively get together uh, and fund uh, the type of communications that are necessary uh, for people to understand the sector. Um, they, uh, they have a lot of challenges understanding it. Just by way of uh, example, uh, I was out of politics for three and a half or four years before I came back in a by-election. And uh, I was on the board of the IESO. Uh, and in ca casual conversation, I would mention to people, what are you doing? And I'd say, well, I'm doing some consulting work, and I'm at University of Ottawa, and I'm on the board of the, the IESO, the Independent Electricity System, op System Operator. And I'm talking to people who are well-networked, most of them well-educated. They have no idea what it is. They have no idea what it is to manage the system. So we collectively have to do better to engage them especially now that we're creating tools that they're going to be able to use with smart meters, uh, with peak saver, uh, with uh, on-bill on, uh, on uh, uh, financing. Uh, there's a whole series of things. Uh, micro, uh, microfit, for example. So we, we have these new products in these new directions, and the more people understand it, the more they will understand pricing, and they'll, the more they'll understand how they can control their pricing. One question on the pricing um, is that we've seen, we've, over the years, we've had projections, you know, various projections by different agencies. And unfortunately, they've tended not to, not to get it right. Um, and it's undermined, to some extent, the credibility of the industry with the consumer. Are you pretty satisfied that the new projections have taken into account some of the shortcomings, perhaps in the past, and we're going to be a little more accurate on, 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 in the next little while? I'm satisfied that they're as good as we're going to get, OK? <laughs> Um, and that's the reason why we're going to an annual energy report, because the system is changing very quickly. You can have recession, you can have boom, uh, you can have new technologies, you can have renewables coming into the system. There, there are a lot of changes. Uh, and so we have to fire with a rifle, not a shotgun, in the energy sector. And that's one of the, one of the policies uh, underlying the plan that we have. Now, moving on from pricing to conservation, the report, virtually page one, talks about conservation first. And that is repeated over and over again in the plan. Perhaps you might want to share with this audience, as well as the folks on television, what exactly you mean and what the government means by conservation first. Well, we're talking uh, what, what is known traditionally as conservation, but we throw in with that demand management, demand response, and storage. And because they're, they're new, Conservation is not new, but the others are, are, uh, uh, are newer uh, and becoming much more sophisticated. Um, and so it's very important uh, that uh, we take every effort to solve our energy requirements uh, other than through generation. Generation is extremely expensive. Uh, there's a long uh, wait time to, to get it up and running. For certain particular types of it in any case. So if we can, if we have a requirement, hypothetically, for 500 megawatts, if we can create that on a permanent basis through conservation, demand management, demand response, and or storage, that's the way we should be going. Because it's less expensive than, than generation. Uh, and it also, incidentally, is much more efficient. Well, now you've raised generation. Let's have a brief chat about that, because obviously a lot of people sitting here in this room have got a vital interest in that. Um, could we start off with nuclear? Yes. Nuclear, in many ways, is the workhorse of the Ontario electricity sector. Certainly that combined, I suppose, with water power. And right now, over 50% of the electricity consumed in Ontario comes from nuclear power. Um, you've already announced previously that new build may not be in the offing. And, and I wonder if you just go through what is in the plan about nuclear and where you see this whole industry going in Ontario, because this is really a made in Ontario industry in many ways. The new nuclear, first of all, is being deferred uh, indefinitely for a number of reasons. For, for, for because of a reduction in demand. And demand comes from a number of reasons. It's a more efficient service. There's more conservation. 
There's the more demand, demand management. Uh, the economy is changing significantly in Ontario. There used to be a lot more manufacturing base, high intensity consumption. Now if you look at, unfortunately, RIM is having some problems, but to use them as an example of creating jobs, uh, 11, 12,000 jobs, most of them here in Ontario, very, very low energy intensive. Uh, if you look at the, uh, what we used to call the high tech capital uh, of Canada, Ottawa, huge, huge uh, IT sector. If you look at Markham, Mississauga, you see a lot of it. Um, uh, there's the entertainment business, movie making, uh, the huge investments and employment in Ontario, and they're not energy intensive. So we don't have the same demand. In 2010, we, we had in that planned new nuclear. Now it's indefinitely deferred. And we are 100% committed to nuclear as being our base load moving forward. Uh, it's still going to be close to 50%. It'll be in the 40s. Uh, and uh, in order to sustain that, uh, we've announced as part of our long-term energy plan that we're going to refurbish the Darlington units and the Bruce units. And we've announced that we're starting with one Bruce unit and one Darlington unit, uh, hopefully uh, starting the actual work of refurbishment uh, in 2016. So um, uh, we're very excited about it. The reaction uh, from the public is very, very positive. Uh, Ontarians like nuclear, uh, and they like the fact that we're going to stay with nuclear as our base load. One question is to follow on from that, and it's the future, say, the can-do technology. Um, if we don't do any new build in Canada, I suppose it runs the risk of perhaps that particular technology being sunsetted. Um, it doesn't mean the nuclear industry is over with, but I'm just curious what your feeling is about the future of the can-do technology and where you see that going. That's, again, another Ontario-based industry, but where does it go from here in, in light of this, do you think? Yeah, I'm very disappointed, and I know a lot of other people are disappointed uh, in the federal government's handling of nuclear. They basically offloaded it. They gave it away, in my opinion. I mean, there was a price paid, but uh, what they gave away was a tremendous opportunity for Canada, uh, for uh, international trade, uh, to keep Ottawa, to keep uh, Canada, and Ontario in particular, on the forefront of the nuclear industry. Um, we believe that there, there is now a significant international component uh, to the, to the energy, uh, nuclear energy sector in Ontario. There's a lot of work being done on maintenance, uh, equipment. Uh, there will be refurbishment work internationally. Uh, we are so well known internationally that uh, uh, the UK, for example, is moving forward with, uh, with uh, new nuclear. They've come over here to Ontario. They're trying to attract their best engineers. They're trying to generate uh, partners who can help them move forward with, with their nuclear. Uh, in terms of new nuclear, we have uh, France and the UK, uh, some South American countries, um, and uh, some, uh, some Eastern countries, Eastern Europe countries, who are still moving to new nuclear. So there's a huge market. Um, and uh, I would like to, in the foreseeable future, uh, see our nuclear sector reach out internationally. Uh, there are a lot of jurisdictions that appreciate our nuclear. There are some that appre appreciate our energy expertise and efficiency even outside of nuclear, uh, just how to manage and operate a system. There's a very large Asian country that, that uh, visited with our ministry uh, a, a month or two ago, uh, really wanting to, to create business to business with Ontario businesses and Ontario agencies in terms of uh, helping them with the efficiency of the system. They have a lot of brownouts. They don't have the same software, the same management we do in operating the system. So there's a tremendous opportunity around the world, not only for nuclear, but for, for uh, energy across the board. Uh, and I'm hoping that I can uh, make that become a priority in the sector, working with the stakeholders in the sector. I wonder if we could switch from nuclear to natural gas. Yes. Um, over the last 10 years, natural gas has grown into a very significant source of, of energy for Ontario. Uh, it hasn't been without its issues. Um, as we know, plants have been relocated and some controversy has been created around that. But nevertheless, natural gas has really come on strong in this province. Where do you see it going now over the next planning period, next five, 10 years? Well, 
I see it increasing and, and having a very important role in the, in the energy sector. Uh, my perspective is, if you go across Ontario and you actually do a count of the number of residences and businesses who are consuming gas and or oil every single day, and we're not a big producer of gas or oil, then you realize we need transmission. We need pipelines. And so for people to say they're against pipelines, it's to say they're against the economy and they're against um, uh, basically a, a good quality of life because everybody's using it and everybody needs it. So we have to be respectful of the oil and gas industry. We also believe we have economic opportunities in oil and gas for technology. Our universities, our research, our innovation, um, uh, there, there's a lot of opportunity. Uh, Alberta uh, is feeling somewhat sheepish or guilty about, uh, about the energy sector. And they've actually made some very um, uh, goodwill gestures to Ontario. They've met with people in my ministry and with me to see how they can engage us uh, in the, the oil and gas industry from a technological point of view, from a business point of view. Uh, we recognize that there's economic development there as it expands, and uh, Ontario will be part of it. One thing I did notice, uh, for the people in, in the smaller towns in northern Ontario, the um, provision, the plan to connect up more gas infrastructure into rural and northern communities will certainly be well received. What kind of timing do you see on that? But that would certainly be well received by a lot of people I know. Well, a lot of that is up to, it's up to the private sector, the distribution companies in Ontario. Um, and we certainly would be happy to facilitate that uh, in any way we can. Uh, in the far north, northwestern Ontario, for example, uh, we're going to certainly move forward with, with more electricity for First Nations. There are seven or eight First Nation communities who will be well served uh, by the uh, north of Dryden plan that is now on the OPA website, where we'll be investing about $2.2 billion in northwestern Ontario, predominantly in transmission but we will be moving that into First Nation communities. Uh, it's a sad situation that uh, we as a country, federally and provincially, uh, have not been able to address those issues sooner, uh, but it's a priority for this government. The OPA has it as a priority, and we're moving forward. If there's any way we can accommodate uh, more gas, and, and that can take different, different forms uh, as well, uh, we're more than happy to sit down with the, uh, the gas sector and. Uh, I try to facilitate those solutions. We seem to be on point of one after another. Let's go to renewables, yes. wind, solar, everything to do with it. Um, where do you stand on this? I know there's been a, some change in terms of the government's plan on the rollout of renewables. Where, where are we moving on, on the renewable front, do you think, over the next while? There's, uh, there's not much change in renewables. Uh, in process, in terms of siting, et cetera, we can talk about that. But in terms of renewables, by 2025, uh, we're predicting that renewables will be 50% of, uh, of our electricity. Um, we, we had projected in the 2010 long-term energy plan, I think it's 10,700 megawatts uh, by 2014, I believe. Uh, and we didn't meet that target. So we are, we are maintaining uh, that procurement target. Uh, we're going to finish it. Uh, up to uh, 2021, we'll have the 10,700 megawatts in, and we'll go beyond that. Uh, certainly, there have been some challenges, particularly with respect to wind and the siting, uh, and uh, we have taken some very significant steps. Uh, we've taken uh, large FIT out of the FIT program, and the OPA has done a lot of work, a lot of consultation. They're still uh, wrapping up a new procurement process for wind. Uh, which will pretty well ensure that it'll be very difficult for an energy proponent to win a contract unless they have a significant engagement with the municipality. There's no veto. We believe a veto uh, will be negative for the system under certain circumstances, but certainly the overwhelming number of, uh, of uh, large renewables uh, will have uh, an engagement with the municipality. Um, if we could shift off generation to a couple of other top, few other topics, innovation. You mentioned that at the outset. 
As you know, Minister, I'm the former chair of the Ontario Centers of Excellence, and we got launched the Center of Excellence for Energy a number of years ago. It's done some really excellent work. And I think it was very attractive that the plan actually talked about innovation. Um, could you talk a little more? You mentioned the uh, Smart Grid Fund, but really the role of innovation in Ontario and how you see that being part of the answer. I mean, clearly in other industries, take the telecom sector, I mean, innovation has revolutionized that sector. Uh, wh where do you see us going in terms of the energy sector? I think and IT will revolutionize the energy sector, and it's on its way. Uh, there are a lot of people uh, in the IT sector who are aware of that now, and they're starting to go into it. Uh, you know, I mentioned Cilantro, which is in Ottawa. Uh, that company was a startup company uh, started up by Antoine Paquin, and he, uh, was, he did some other startups in the IT sector. Uh, he went down to, uh, to California and he came back to, uh, to, to Ottawa and he started Solantra using IT technology to build a better inverter for solar. Uh, if you look at uh, Temporal Power, uh, they've got a flywheel which is storage, uh, which, which, is, uh, which is an improvement over a lot of the storage that's available. Uh, when we visited that site and they opened the panel of the flywheel, it's all technology. Mm -hmm. It's all technology driven. Uh, if you look at uh, demand response in terms of uh, aggregating and uh, getting the IASO to get its systems in harmony with all these aggregated contracts, it's all IT, or a lot of it's IT, information technology. So I see that accelerating at a rapid pace, uh, the way technology has done in other sectors. Um, and uh, uh, there, there are a lot of brains now, uh, a lot more brains in technology, and a lot more startups now uh, in demand management, demand response, in storage. Uh, and uh, that's another thing that's going to push, uh, uh, push the demand down um, and, uh, and, and have less requirement uh, for new generation in the future. I remember about 12 years ago or a little more, there's all the talk of convergence between gas and electricity, which never actually occurred. It may be that what we're seeing is a convergence in IT and energy because I believe of smart grid and, and how things are heading. I, yeah. I think it's a fact of life. Uh, you know, we went to uh, Ryerson University uh, for the Green Button um, a launch. Uh, it was actually initiated in the U.S., but we have probably more capacity here to do it in Ontario because of the smart meters. Uh, and the Green Button, simply, you can go on your iPhone and you can, you can connect with the uh, website of your uh, LDC, your utility, and you could push a green button and download, either in your iPhone or in your computer, all the information that's in your own smart meter in your residence. And we have a competition going now, uh, which we started at Ryerson, uh, with financial rewards uh, for people to create apps. So hypothetically, to use a flippant example, I guess, um, uh, David Peterson could be down in Florida on vacation, uh, and uh, he wants to know uh, what's happening back home or with his grandchildren. He can go on his iPhone, and he can see what the consumption is in the residence. And he knows whether there's a party going on or whether they're not attending to, uh, attending to uh, turning off the lights and uh, turning down some of the appliances. But, I mean, but there are a lot of apps that are going to be coming forward. Uh, the number of apps that have been created in all the other sectors, whether it's uh, sports apps or uh, shopping apps or you name it, there will be a whole pile of energy apps that will be coming forward. So the IT sector has arrived. It's here to stay and it's flourishing in the energy sector. I don't know if those Ryerson students have thought of the impact of what they're inventing on their life, eh? and their parents will be able to keep track of them in a way that they, never happened before. They're, they're, they're doing this in a little enterprise center, um, a digital enterprise center like at Ryerson. DMZ? I forget the official name yeah. of it. The DMZ. Uh, and uh, yeah. I spoke to some of the students. They create corporations as students, and they create apps, and they're making money on them. And they're creating intellectual property. And I talked to some, there, there were these three young uh, uh, women students who were in one of these corporations and they had big smiles on their face. They're paying their way through university by creating apps in the actual, in the actual courses that they're taking. So that's also a change in education. Uh, there's a lot more entrepreneurial initiative uh, in education.
Sounds like better than a summer job, anyway. Sure it? is. Um, can I can go back to one thing you were describing was the, our, the energy, Ontario Energy Report. Um, right now we've got, there's a lot of paper out on this industry, as you well know. I mean, the ISO has reports out, the OPA has reports out, the OEB has reports, we have reports on reports. How is this new report going to be better than, than this plethora? We, is it going to eliminate the, a lot of the other reports and this will be the Bible? Or how, how do you see this evolving in terms of reports? Because we've got a lot of them. And there's a load of paper around. It will be the mandate of these two uh, agencies to create a report that is usable and practicable and correct for the industry. So we know where we are on supply and we know where we are in demand and we know what the trends are and what the, the innovations and, and direction of the sector is going. Um, and so uh, I, I think it's very timely given the nature of the innovation and changes that are going through the sector. Um, one thing you probably wouldn't be surprised to ask you about is LDCs. Yes. Um, I think the, the distribution network in Ontario is undervalued. Um, it, it, its uh, reach out to consumers is tremendous. What role do you see LDCs playing in terms of this whole energy plan and, and, and how should they be dealing with it? Because there seems to be a real role there. Um, you know, I was, uh, I was the shareholder representative on an LDC for six years, uh, which was Hydro Ottawa, when I was mayor of the city of Ottawa. Um, and um, I learned then that there was a certain amount of frustration uh, in the LDC sector. Um, and it was, like, uh, it was like a racehorse that was being held back. They had a lot of ideas for innovation, for move, for change, etc. Uh, and they felt they were somewhat uh, in a straitjacket, including on what conservation programs they can do, innovations they wanted to do. So um, as part of the consultation of this long-term energy plan, we, we consulted very closely with LDCs. In fact, we designated a senior person to go and speak with the CEO and or chair of every LDC across the province to find out where they feel they could go to add more value to the system. <clears throat> and um, we also spoke about these issues with other stakeholders in the sector. And so uh, one of the follow-ups of this plan is actually to provide uh, more avenues for uh, innovation and participation in conservation. Uh, it may very well be that the uh, uh, that the uh, on-bill uh, financing will be administered by the LDCs uh, moving forward uh, or utilities moving forward. Uh, they will also uh, have more leeway. Uh, we have some details to work out uh, moving forward with the Ontario Energy Board. I don't know if Rosemary LeClaire is here. We're not doing anything behind your back, Rosemary. <laughs> anyway, um, we, uh, we really, uh, we really uh, feel that uh, we can move forward uh, with LDCs. The LDCs are closest to the customer. So if you're talking about on-bill financing, they're the closest. If you're talking about conservation, that's on the ground. Let's take Peak Saver Plus, for example. I mentioned that uh, this morning on, uh, on CBC Radio. Peak Saver Plus, there's a study that was, uh, that was in the Toronto Star that was released on the first results of Peak Saver Plus. Uh, I'll explain what that is in a moment. But there's an average saving on your electricity bill of 9%. This is a monitor and new types of thermostats that, are, that Toronto Hydro or Hydro Ottawa would, would put into your residence free of charge as long as you do the plan with them. Um, and uh, you can save 9% uh, on, your energy, uh, on your energy costs. This study has shown that's the result after one year. So I say to every person, if this is televised or it's going out, call up Toronto Hydro, call up Ottawa Hydro and say, I want Peak Saver Plus, and it'll be delivered to your door, and you'll have it, and you'll be able to save on your energy costs. So when we're talking about pressure on prices, and we're taking decisions to put pressure on prices coming down, we're taking $70 billion out in the next uh, 20 years so that the prices would be mitigated. But in addition to that, we have to create the tools for people to take control of their electricity prices. Peak Saver Plus is new technology. It's smart meters. Smart meters is unbelievable technology. The ISO spent three years working with IBM, 
in a major, major IT contract. Just in time delivery when it was supposed to arrive, it arrived, uh, and it's one of the best assets that we have among all the, the, the energy uh, uh, sectors across North America. Well, our time is almost up. Could I ask you one question just before we leave? What are the next two or three steps you're going to take to implement this plan? What do you see as the next two or three critical steps that you're going to take, the ministry's going to take? To well, I implement? think there are critical steps for every major component of the plan. If you're talking about nuclear refurbishment, we've got to do the procurement, and we've got to move forward. And Bruce and OPG now know that uh, it's, it's a go-ahead. The, the, uh, the refurbishments are going to start. If you're talking about renewable, large renewables, then we're going to be doing the new procurement. And that new procurement <clears throat> is probably uh, going to be available before the end of the first quarter uh, of uh, 2014. Uh, if you're talking about, uh, if you're talking about uh, storage, uh, our smart grid fund, we hope we can renew it in the next budget. Uh, we've had two rounds of it, $25 million each. Uh, there are people in the sector operating here in Ontario, creating new technology in Ontario. Uh, so uh, we want to incent them to do more on storage. Demand response, the same thing. So you take every element uh, of that plan and there is a next specific step uh, moving forward. Well, thank you very much, Minister. My pleasure. Being with her. I, I hope everybody here in this room and on television agreed that you're more plugged into the LTEP than you were at the start. Yes. And uh, thank you for being with us and, and being here so rapidly after the plan was released. David, thank you. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to call upon Kathy Sprague, Vice President at Bruce Power, to say the appreciation. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Minister, for sharing um, some great context about the government's long-term energy plan. I think this format works perfectly. It, um, uh, does it in a very casual environment. And since you brought up apps, I'm from Bruce Power. We have a wonderful app on the iTunes store. So when you get back to your office or home tonight, make sure you download the Bruce Power app uh, to your um, iPad. Um, over the last decade, Ontario's energy, energy system has come a long way. From the viewpoint of Bruce Power, this is clear. It's important the energy sector works to find innovative ways um, to adapt to a changing environment while securing the certainty and predictability needed for, to make long-term investments. That's what we've done at Bruce Power, and we'll con continue to do so. Since 2001, we've invested $7 billion of private funds into public electricity assets through our unique public-private par partnership. Our unions are owners of the business. 87% of our employees are also owners in the business by investing their hard-earned money into, into our business and into nuclear technology. Additionally, we have a strong partnership with our craft unions and have provided quality, high-paying jobs for thousands of trades workers across the province. A decade ago, electricity from coal generation, generation represented over a quarter of Ontario's electricity. Now we're in a position to phase out coal, which has been internationally recognized and praised by former U.S. Vice President Al Gore. At Bruce Power, we are proud of the role we have played in this along with other sources. Once we're off coal, we need to stay off coal and embrace emissions-free electricity. The minister also talked about prices. It's been getting a lot of uh, play in the media. Clearly more public education is needed, um, and we all have a role to play, as the minister said. Our challenge is to keep the air we breathe clean while keeping electricity rates low for families in Ontario's businesses. We need to ensure we make decisions for the long term to ensure electricity prices remain stable and predictable. It's important we recognize the role of all generation sources. At Bruce Power, we have taken a pragmatic view that the role of nuclear, uh, which the minister has said is almost half of Ontario's energy, energy requirements, base load, um, but it also has to be uh, mixed with hydro, wind, solar, and gas for peaking requirements. And we're delighted that the refurbishment of both Bruce and Darlington are key elements of the long-term energy plan. Uh, conservation is also a priority, um, and this also includes 
uh, using our energy assets in a manner that has uh, the maximum benefits to all ratepayers. Again, thank you very much, Minister, for joining us today. We look forward to, move for we look forward to moving forward now that the long-term energy plan has been released and turning this policy into action. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, I'd like to call upon uh, Mr. Tim Smithman, uh, Director of the Empire Club of Canada and from Samsung Renewable Energy, and Tina Arvanitas from the Ontario Energy Association to present you with a gift. Before we let you go, uh, the Empire Club and the OEA would like to present you with a small token of appreciation. I'm not sure if many of you are aware, but today is actually Giving Tuesday, a day where people around the world are urged to take a moment and give back to our community. Minister Shirelli, you have a long history of giving back to the Royal Ottawa Hospital, and to thank you for joining us today, the Empire and Club and the OEA will be making a donation to the Royal Ottawa Foundation in your name. We also want to honor you, David, for your contribution to today's discussion, and the Empire Club and the OEA will be making a donation on your behalf to Toronto Sick Kids Hospital Foundation. Thank you both. I would like to... Uh, Go ahead. I would just like to take a moment to thank the Empire Club and the Ontario Energy Association for giving us this platform today. Uh, I think it was very helpful, but uh, certainly uh, the Ministry of Energy and I as Minister appreciate the opportunity and the hospitality here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we'd just like to thank the National Post, our print media sponsor, uh, Van Valkenburg for providing our AV. The Empire Club and the OEA are available on Twitter and on our website. You can find out more information about our membership on our respective websites. Thank you all for coming. Thank you in particular to the OEA for, uh, for helping us uh, deliver such a, a great event. Um, thank you all for coming. We look forward to seeing you again soon. This meeting of the Empire Club of Canada is now adjourned. Thank you.